Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Hey, I don't think... I, I know I'm excited to be here, and I hope you're ready for this, because um, I don't know about you, but it's exciting. It's too late for me to back out of this now, so we just got to roll with it now. So if we go, we go, and if we don't, we don't. We get out early, we get out late. Either way, we're going to have a good time, hopefully, today. But my name is Jacob Hardesty, and I am blessed to have met a smoking hot Guatemalan princess. And... <laughs> Yes, she was a princess because now she's my queen, and together, I'll pause, yes, aw, and together we have the privilege of leading Accelerate, which is our ministry here on Wednesday nights for 6th through 12th grade, and we have an amazing team of volunteers who love loving on your kids, so if you were in 6th through 12th grade, tell your parents to stop talking right now, and you, to- and you zone in right now. If you haven't made Accelerate a part of your midweek experience on Wednesday nights, we'd love to invite you out. It's from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We meet right here in this room. And if you can't make it, we do our best to always stream it on Facebook Live so you can look us up on Facebook, give us a like, and keep up to date with what's going on with Accelerate. But you know what's crazy is that um, Accelerate's great and all that, but I just want to share some wins with you with what's going on in Accelerate now. Just in the last three weeks, we've had six newcomers show up to our Wednesday night on Accelerate, which is absolutely amazing, yeah. Three have signed up for baptism, which is happening next Sunday, and then two just this last week gave their lives to Christ, so we get to see some awesome things happening right here in this room. Not just on Sundays, but we get to see life change happen all through the week too. You know, it's hard to believe that um, we're almost through the end of January of 2019. And I know that um, many of us set goals or what we like to call resolutions. Um, those things we write down on our fridge or put up on our wall and we put them down. Um, and if you're like me, I know sitting around Thanksgiving or sitting around for Christmas, I know the New Year's is approaching, so I want to maximize my future diet anyways. So while we're sitting there eating mashed potatoes, I'm just like, pass them on some more this way, hand me another roll, I'll steal a piece of ham from Lisa. I'll worry about this next week at the New Year starts when the approaches and we can, that way instead of losing like, you know, 10 or 15 pounds, I can maximize that to like 20 or 25 pounds and that way it looks good at the end of the year for my New Year's resolution. But you know what, um, uh, we like to live our life without any restraints, without anything holding us back, but I was reading some stuff and I learned, I got really discouraged because you know, only 9.2% of people actually have follow through with their New Year's resolution. So that means if there's 100 people in this room, there's 10 of you that are actually awesome and are going to come, come through it, all right? So it's kind of discouraging. Um, and we just finished up an amazing series called Your Best Year Yet, where our pastors um, looked at how we can make 2019 even better than we've ever imagined before. And they broke it down. And some highlights that I took away from it was we need to start by praying and fasting more, which I don't think you can ever pray enough. We can probably never fast enough. Sometimes we've got to give up stuff to go up. And the other thing is we've got to narrow our focus. Sometimes we look at it and it's so broad and so big that maybe we just need to focus in on one little thing right in front of us and get that down first before we can move on to something else that God has for us. But you know, it's such an amazing series that if you missed it or if you missed any part, I encourage you to go back on any of our platforms and watch it, share it, get on there and share it with some friends because there's something that can be taken away from it from anybody. And you know what? I know God has big plans for us as a church in 2019, you've heard the vision of our pastors the last few weeks, but I want you to know that God has big plans for you as well in 2019. It's an amazing opportunity for us to be here and to see what God is doing. And God has something great purpose for you to do. The thing is that you have to have the actual, but it all depends on your ability to actually do. I have a lot of good ideas, but kind of like my New Year's resolution, it has no follow-through. And so those good ideas just become good ideas and they're just thoughts. And then someone's like, oh, yeah, I got another idea. And I'm like, yeah, I have a great idea. Well, what happened to the last one? I don't know. It's somewhere else. So, so at some point, you must take a step and do what God has destined you to do. And you know, I've learned that there's things in life, looking back on my life, if I look back and I look at the things that I think I've missed out on, because I know it was God 
was telling me to do something. He was asking me to do something. And because I had no follow through, because I had no ability to actually do, I know I missed out on a lot of stuff and a lot of cool stuff that God had for me. And, and I was sitting here talking to Lisa and she's like, you know, this is kind of where the, the title of this, this the message comes from, Broken But Beautiful. And our pastors talk about we have to operate out of the overflow that we're in. And if we're going to jump in here into a, me- and a passage here in a second, but if we're all vessels, if we're all cups, we've all been through things basically where the enemy has taken our cup and he's slammed it up against the wall. And I can't take it and I can't myself, I can't glue those pieces back together. But because God is absolutely amazing and what he does, he's taken those pieces and he's put them back together. And everything that I've missed out on, that I can start doing what he's called me to do. And he builds these pieces back together. And that's how we get broken but beautiful. Because some people look at us, the world looks at us, and yeah, we got scars. We got wounds that we have left behind us. We got things that that have left a lot of baggage with us. But when you look at it, what God has for us, we can be broken, but we're absolutely beautiful. And I want you to know he's got something big for us in 2019. And and this time of year, anytime I get discouraged, and in this time of year at the beginning of the year, I love turning this this scripture and I love reading it. And um, don't get freaked out when we turn to this, but we're going to go to the book of Revelation and we're going to dig deep into what it has, all right? So turn with me to Revelation 21, verse 5. And here's why I love this. Because Revelation 21 and verse 5, Revelation is the very last book of the Bible. And chapter 21 is the very last chapter in the Bible. And here we are, that in the last book of the Bible, at the last chapter of the Bible, in verse 5 it says, And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are faithful and true. So I like this for two reasons. One, because um, it makes God sound a little bit like a rapper. Because he says, write this down for these words are faithful and true. God is spitting some bars. And uh, John, um, he's writing this book for God. And you know, some people, if you're a 90's kid, you might know little John. So right here we have little John the Revelator. And so we have little John writing these words that says, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said, write this down for these words are faithful and true. And here's why I like this, because it's the last book of the last chapter of the Bible, and God is saying all that junk you went through, all that stuff, you know, the divorce you went through this last year, that bad breakup, that horrible relationship that you went through, God has something new for you in 2019, and forget about it because I'm God, and I'm going to make all things new. And why does this get so exciting? Because it also says that God specializes in taking old things and making them new. You can flip back to 2 Corinthians 5.17 and it says that old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Because that because it doesn't matter how messed up we are, how bad we've been, it doesn't matter how sin, your, big your sin is or how bad your guilt is, God specializes in taking old things and making them new again. And, it, and it's found all through the Bible. He said he can, he can lift everything up and He can change everything. In fact, when we, I say we can find this all through the Bible, we're going to step back a few more books in the Bible and we're going to go to John. And what we're going to talk about today, this theme of making all things new, we're going to go to Jesus' very first miracle in the Bible, the very first one that's recorded in the Bible. And um, in fact, His very first miracle is turning water into wine. And I know there's some people... Um, that get really excited when we start talking about that the Bible starts talking about wine. And we're not going to go there today. We're just going to talk about the fact that God turned water into wine. Okay? And I have a lot of questions when I read the Bible. There's a lot of things that um, when I ask these questions, they'd be answered if I would just have some follow through and I would study it out and the answers would be right there. Then there's other times where it only comes through if I, if I study it and then I pray about it and then God reveals it. And then there's some things that I'm just going to have to ask, you know, Moses when we get to heaven and say, you guys had it made. Why'd you have to go through and do all this kind of stuff? But that's another time, another story. But I have a lot of questions and one of them is why, why was the very first milk recorded of God turning water into wine? Why in the world would he do that? I mean, if I think about it from my perspective, if I'm sitting around with certain friends, I'm like talking about why would Jesus turn water into wine other than the fact that it would be the coolest party trick in history that you show up anywhere and like instantly you're the guy that can turn water into wine. 
that would be absolutely awesome. You know, when the disciples were sitting there and they said, Father, teach us to pray, there had to be one that pulled him to the side and he's like, hey, teach us how to turn water into wine too. Because we want to know that trick too. We, yeah, praying is good, but also let's teach us this cool little trick here. Um, but I know that didn't make it into the Bible. That's just Jake's interpretation. But John 2, 1 through 11 is where we find this story. And I want to give you that for reference because I'm not going to go through and read all 11 verses. I'm just going to talk to you about it today and we're going to break it down. But here's what's happening. Um, Jesus is traveling and he often frequented this place. So I was thinking about this. It's kind of like if you live in this area and we're going to go to northwest Arkansas, then all the time I'll stop at Stang's and I get some gas, or I get a cup of coffee, and it's kind of a midway point. And this is kind of what it is. Jesus was traveling, and his disciples were traveling from one location to another, and we know that they frequent this place a lot because, well, he's invited to a wedding. Well, as they're traveling through, you don't just travel through a place and get invited to a, to a wedding randomly. That means he's been there a lot. He's built relationships up. There's stuff going on there that he knows. And so Jesus and his guys are at this wedding they're attending, His mom in there, and suddenly there's a problem. There's no more wine. The wine supply ran out at the festivities, it says. So Mary, I wish I could do my mother-in-law impersonation because, you know, the last time we preached, um, Lisa talked about a telenovela. Well, everything on her side of the family is kind of like a telenovela. And um, if her mom's involved, it's going to be very dramatic. And so I can only imagine that this situation right here was a Hispanic mom in the middle of a telenovela running up to her son saying, we've ran out of wine. So she runs up to Jesus and he says, we ran out of wine. And of course, Jesus is hanging out with his friends. He's like, so what? It doesn't matter. And she's like, Jesus, you don't get it. They ran out of wine. We need more wine. (laughs) And this is where it gets funny. Because he says, woman! (laughs) It is not... My time yet. But we're not there yet. So it says they ran out of wine. So let's hit the first problem first. I studied this out and how big of a problem was it that they ran out of wine? And so as I'm reading this, it was mainly, it was an embarrassment on my part because of my depth of study, but it was also an embarrassment to run out of wine at a wedding party. If we get really deep into it, the bride's family could sue the groom for not throwing a big enough party and providing enough wine for the celebration. In fact, the marriage could be withdrawn and that family would be kind of a disgrace to the community and they would be outcasts for a long time. And that's getting way, 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 way out of it. It's just a major embarrassment. So why is Mary freaking out? She's freaking out because she doesn't want her friends to become the embarrassment of the community. So like I say, Jesus says, woman! Mm-mm. I'm just going to pause for a second because I promise you that... That, let me tell you the difference between um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the mother of Jacob, um, in this situation. <laughs> because I promise you that if I would have said that to my mom, not only would she have walked over and grabbed me by the ear, but she would have been scolding God, said, Father God, He may be your son, but I'm going to kill Him. I'm going to kill Him good, and you're going to have to raise Him twice. And then, once she turned around, you know, because I have this ability, my rolls, my eyes kind of, you know, turn a little bit, and she goes, you... She'd be like, you roll your eyes at me one more time, I'm going to smack them out of the back of your head. And she, just, she would just go on and on and on. So I'm telling you right now that Mary was a lot more, um, I love you, Mom, it's okay. Um, but if it would have been my little sister, she would have got away with it. But that's another thing. Um, so Jesus, Jesus, she looks at Jesus and she says, you've got to do something. She walks over to the servant, like only a mama can do, and she goes, you see that guy? That's my son do whatever he says to do, and then she walks off. She just probably flips her hair, she grabs and she walks back and shuts back into the party, and she just leaves Jesus to do what Jesus is going to do. And here's what's cool. It says Jesus takes these three three water pots, and he tells them what to do. He didn't even touch them. He tells the servants, get some water, take it to the governor of the feast. So they grab the water, they deliver it to the governor of the feast, He tastes it and he's like, oh, you've done what no one else has done. You've saved the best wine for the last. Woo, hey, yeah. And he was feeling good at that point. Anyways, Jesus turns water into wine. It doesn't make any sense. Why would Jesus turn water into wine? And so I decided to dig a little bit deeper and really dive in to the Scripture and see why it's such a big deal 
about this miracle that we find in John. So I got to looking at it, and I got super excited. I got fired up, because when you start digging down into it, and you learn about what's actually involved in the Scripture, it can change everything. Because what happens is this one miracle, the very first miracle, and we find in the book of John, Jesus reveals His entire purpose of the entire book of the Bible. So you see these pots of water, the pots of water that He used, um, the, the water in that was used for washing feet. If you didn't know the mode of transportation, the primary mode of transportation back in the day um, was feet. So they walked everywhere. Some people might have had sandals on. So when you went into somebody's house, you would walk in, you'd take off your flip-flops and, and set them down, and then the lowest ranking official, the lowest ranking servant would come in, he'd grab some water, and he'd pour it over, and he'd clean your feet, you'd get a little pedicure right there before you went in, and then he would take that water that was caught, and they'd go and pour it in these big pots of water. So that's how it worked. All, all, the, all the, the, who knows, the, the donkey poop, the chickens, all that kind of stuff that you walk through, all that dirty, nasty junk, that was on the people's feet. And so somebody would come in, they'd pour the water them, they'd wash them up real good, and then they would take that basin, and then they would pour it in this pot. Well, these same pots that they got the water out of to make the wine out of, okay? So we're making that connection. So Jesus, being amazing, looks at this old, nasty, dirty, lint floating around, funky, I touched my stomach, you see that? The nasty, <laughs> lint floating around, funky water, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, if I think about it, if I want a mental image, just think of Grand Lake, okay? So we take that nasty, dirty water, and um, Jesus says, go take a take a cup, dip some water out of it, and taking it to the governor of the feast. Now imagine that situation, how, how, that, um, how that order went down. I like to think, um, you guys, some of you guys know Zach, he plays the drums, Cody, his brother-in-law. These guys are always giving each other a hard time. Well, imagine if those two were the servants. And Jesus was like, hey, Zach, you go dip a cup and you take it to the governor of the feast. Well, Zach's no idiot. He knows what's in that water. He knows what's in it. And Cody's like, ah, it's your turn, ha <laughs> ha, making fun of him. So Zach's grabbing this water, and they're probably shoving it back and forth the whole time, fighting about it. But you know, the Bible doesn't say that. There was no pushback at all. They didn't, they didn't worry about it. But it says that the servant takes it, and somewhere in the process, if you notice, Jesus never touched it, but somewhere in the process of scooping the water out and taking it to the governor, water is transformed. So somewhere in the process of taking the least likely, most likely to be thrown out, that nasty, dirty, nobody will believe in, absolutely disgusting water, he takes to the governor of the feast. The governor tastes it. He judges it and says it's better wine than he's ever had before. And it's absolutely amazing. And I want you to know this, that only God can take something that everybody else would discard. Nobody would use. You can be messed up. You can be broken. You can be abused. You can be sinful. You can be shameful. Something that's so broken and thrown out and make it so beautiful. Only God can do that. And that's the God we serve. And that's the very first miracle that Jesus does. And to show you no matter how messed up you are, He doesn't look at how you see you. He sees you how God sees you. And He sees your potential and where He can take you. And that's including right now in this moment where He can take you to in 2019. I know there's people in this room that feel like those pots of water. You've been through a lot of stuff in your life. You know, we've, we've had that cup, we've smashed it against the wall to where we feel like we can't even hold the nasty, dirty water, let alone hold fine wine that God has for us. But you know, that's not what it matter. You feel like you're ready to be thrown out. You're like, don't even bother with me. Just throw me out back, toss me in the lake, whatever it needs. And you've already given up on 2019. And here we are, the last weekend of January. And you've already gave up on yourself. So I want you to know, stop writing yourself out of things that God has already written you into and get excited again for what He has purpose for you. He has a plan for you and He has a lot of exciting things for you. And if nobody's ever told you this before, God loves you no matter how you are or what you've done, or where you've been. Because God sees you who you can be, not who you were. And I want you to know this. I'm, a, I'm here to really encourage you today. Though no matter what life has thrown at you, no matter what He's taken you through, I don't know, care what the enemy has made you believe. There's people in here that I know that have been through horrible marriages. You've been married. You've been remarried. You've been married again. You've been through bad breakups. You've been in abusive relationships. Some of you are so addicted to this computer screen that's in front of you that it's warped your, imagine, it's warped your mind so bad that you don't know what a relationship is really like. 
But I want you to know that your mind can be messed up, your body can be messed up, but it doesn't matter because there's healing in Jesus and that's all Jesus wants for you is that it's just like He can take that nasty, dirty, throw out water and He can turn it into the best wine that we have ever seen before in our life. And, and that's where I want to be at today. He can change you so much. I want you to know He can change you so much that when people see you again, from before when who you were to who you are now, that you, they won't even recognize you. And it seems funny to say that, that like, oh, they're going to recognize you because they know who I am. Well, yeah, they know your physical appearance, but it's how you carry yourself. It's the joy that radiates from your body and what God is doing inside of you that changes you to where you're not even recognizable to people around you. Like I said, He can make old things pass away and He can make all things new. It's a great verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And here's one thing, last thing I want to leave you with today. I'm used to speaking to teenagers, so like 15, 20 minutes, I'm done. (laughs) Ready for a Red Bull. Stick around, second service is going to get good. I had some kombucha and I got green tea and Red Bull's up next, so I'm ready to go. If you notice in the Bible, it says that there were six, six pots. And if you think about from a biblical perspective, six is the number of man. Six is the number of evil. You know, we got six, 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 and everything related to everything of the enemy is six. But Jesus, being Jesus, one Jesus, takes these six pots, puts them with himself, and creates the most perfect, beautiful picture that we can see through the Bible. So yeah, six might be the biblical um, metaphor for what man and imperfection and sin, but as we take the seven, the Jesus, this symbol of perfection, and we put the two together, we have this beautiful story, and we see Jesus' true role as Savior. So if you guys would, I want you to bow your heads with me today. And I just want you to think about it today. Think about the story. More than just Jesus taking and turning water into wine. Think about you being that dirty pot of water. The lint floating around. All that nasty stuff. All that junk that God has that God has that the enemy has put in our lives. As we think on it There's only one way to clean that up. We saw God never touched it. There's nothing the pots did. There's nothing man did. There's nothing the servants did. All they were was obedient to what Jesus said to them. And so if you're sitting here today and you feel like you're that pot of water, you've given up, you're worthless, you have no value, you've written yourself off for 2019, I want you to know that when we put you in combination with Jesus, you're going to be able to see things that you've never seen before. And some people are like, well, how do I know if I'm ready to ask for forgiveness? Or how do I know if I'm ready for God to make that transition, that process happen in my life? Well, you know what? I guarantee if that's you, there's something stirring inside of you. There's something stirring inside your heart. And you can't explain it. You don't know what's going on. But that's the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus knocking on that. And it says that if we'll answer, He'll open And so I want to invite you today that if it's you and you're ready to transform yourself and be ready for 2019 and you want to accept God into your heart and let Jesus come in and restore you, I just want you to slip your hand up today so we can be praying for you. Nobody is looking around. The heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Nobody. Awesome. I see your hand. That God can come in and make you new and He can turn that nasty, dirty water into the best wine we've ever seen. Awesome. Awesome. You know what, church, let's pray together. We're going to pray for those ones who raise their hand. You guys, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. Lord, I know I'm broken. Lord, but I ask you to fix me new. Lord, thank you for forgiving me my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if that was you today and you accepted Christ, I want to encourage you to go back and grab a next step kit. That is the next step. Once you make that decision, 
there's, there's a Bible in here, there's a message in here from our pastors, and they will help you to get started in the next direct direction that you need to go and where God has planned for you. So if you would, give it up for those who made that decision today. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.